Yeah. Right. I'm very glad to have you all here. So many people, that is fantastic. And I'm very happy that, that I can announce some very special guests today that have some kind of prominence. That is, for one, André Meister and Ulf Bohmeyer. And they will now give you the following talk. That is Mobile Phones uh, Query. And um, have fun. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Nice to have you all here. Also, the German Interior Minister Horst Seehofer is happy to see you. And we will talk about mobile phone cell queries, the unknown creature. Who of you knows what a mobile phone cell query actually is? Oh, right. That's about half, I think. The other half will learn it today. <laughs> And uh, we will talk a bit about what the problem is with mobile phone cell queries and what you can actually do against it. What we will not tell you is the whole detail about what a mobile phone network is. Others can do that much better. Harald Berke and Dieter Spur have been doing this at many on many congresses 10 years ago. For example, when for the first time they showed their mo open, open source mobile phone network not just only not just how a mobile phone network works but also how you can run your own which of course is taking happening at this congress as well and that's what we build on we will not tell you in detail how a network like this works but we'll talk about a small aspect of it we'll ask an expert how it works uh, this uh, is the responsive min responsible minister, and he told us that a mobile phone network consists of individual phone cells, so every end user's device uh, that, that you uh, connect to such a network communicates at, each <coughs> at every time with one single phone cell or none at all. And through that, every communication with such a device can be assigned to an individual cell, which is logical, because if it would not be sending anything, there would be nothing to receive. And this here is in a village in the state of Brandenburg, in the Berlin surroundings, where a new uh, antenna was put up. And only if you have those, you can communicate, and then the network also knows where the device is, because the position of those cells is known. An operator, of course, knows more or less <coughs> exactly where these masts are, and Every communication that goes through such a network, through such a cell, can then be located. And it's not just the operators that know this. This is public information that you can see, that you can measure. And the devices know it too. Otherwise, they wouldn't know with what uh, uh, mass they can communicate. And that is, here's a map with uh, from the uh, based on OpenStreetMap. It's called OpenCellID, where you can uh, put these masts on a map, and this is the area at Congress here. You see all the masts here. If you're, uh, that's what your devices use. If they don't, don't just use the internal network. And if these devices communicate with such a network, then with every communication, so-called metadata or traffic data is generated, and that contains a lot of individual fields. Which I will, which we show you in this example. So these are the various records that are generated at a that the provider at the provider of Malte Spitz, a privacy activist who used to work for the Green Party, and he asked his phone operator for all the data that they were holding about him. Uh, and here you can see, I think this lasts for 11 minutes. That is a few weeks of mobile communication by Malte Spitz from the year 2009. And the interesting thing is that so many, uh, so such a various amount of data, such varied information is generated. These are the data of just one person from selected days, but every single communication that this device makes with the network, generates a record, uh, and each entry has 29 fields, 29 details, uh, begin and end of the communication time zone, what service was used, and telephony is about a quarter of the information, SMS is about 2% these days, but what's very important now is mobile internet connections every time the uh, Twitter or WhatsApp app uh, sends something into the internet every single time a record is generated at your mobile phone provider or operator. And um, with those 29 fields, 
uh, you have things like uh, the kind of communication, the number that's being called, the the MC, uh, the the SIM card number, the uh, serial number of the device, IP address, uh, the uh, internal one in the network, and the public one, and of course the phone cell. Every phone cell that the phone communicates with has its own globally unique ID, which consists of a country code, a location code, and a cell ID. And this, taken together with the location data, uh, makes up six or seven of these fields. And what that gives you the information that the phone received an SMS uh, text message at some point and was in a certain cell. Now, extra data such as, such as a Wi-Fi hotspot may be there, but sometimes not. But these are the communications, the metadata that are being generated each time. And how long is that being stored? That's what we will see next. Right, this is the important question. How long is this data being stored? In the data retention law, the thing was that 10 weeks was the, the it used to be six months in the old German data retention law and the new one uh, asks for 10 weeks. But what that means, uh, we have seen with Multispitz and the problem with this data retention is that it is currently ineffective in Germany for the country of North Rhine-Westphalia. But the question is whether the providers uh, voluntarily more or less store all these fields. Anyway, the German magazine Spiegel researched how long providers had been storing before the new data retention law came into force. And uh, that's what we've put on this slide here. So internally into network, it was between zero and 180 dates, depending on the network. And we don't quite know how these things are handled today. As I said, data retention is not obligatory for providers these days, but that doesn't mean that providers don't make don't act as they did before. There is no guarantee. These data are earlier than the, the date that the new data retention law came into force. Uh, so probably these data voluntarily are being held for quite a time, even without an obligation by law. Uh, and um, it's often one month at least with data retention three, but sometimes even longer for debugging, accounting. And sometimes these providers like would like to use these data commercially too, but that's the subject for another talk. These data, <coughs> it just looks like a boring table, but they tell quite a lot about a certain person. They can tell you uh, this is uh, from Walter Spitz, uh, from the data set that, he, that we, you saw before. He, you see the network where he connected to, the dots are communication partners, the nodes are communication partners, and there's maybe then somewhere a central point in the center where he is. It's, well, it's basically a social network, but this is not that important. Uh, let's show the other video with the location data. Ah, we didn't add it, I'm sorry. And that would be the more important one. Um, the project Verräterisches uh, Handy by Zeit Online. We will just, just, try, just try it again. So there it is. This is called a life hack. So this is just from this metadata and the location data from the mobile phone say where Malte Spitzer was. In some ranges this is quite exact because you know exactly where the tennis are and you see where somebody is, which congresses it, somebody attends. attends where people sleep and where people sleep when uh, they don't sleep at home. These are all data about just one person. With the mobile phone cell query, query there's not uh, just data from one person, from, but from all person in that in a particular cell. One example of a, um, such a query that happened that the police of Berlin did. This is the starting point how the police wanted yeah the right to the local judge <laughs> <Most angel. laughs> to a judge um, we wanted to start such a, they wanted to start uh, such a query and you see below 
a query of uh, mo mobile phone cells where this query shall be done. In these days, in, uh, they're usually not the cells written by themselves because that's a lot, a lot of work to, to, to find all that data for uh, GSM, UMTS, for all providers. Usually these days, uh, the police only adds the location, Berlin, street, etc. And then the network providers uh, search out which cells are relevant. That's a theory. But in practice, we visualize this a lot. Uh, example, in Berlin, there were a series of, of crimes that they wanted to investigate. And the police came, uh, they had this, uh, this location. And you see the, in the circles which cell phone towers are resettable at this, in the street. And the police asked the operators to just give out all, all of them in the hope to find an, uh, an entry of who did this, who did it, and they found thousands, uh, ten thousands, hundred thousands of uh, data sets. So you see that contrast in the first video, you had one person only. This is now the reverse case. You don't ask for, uh, for one cell phone number, you ask for many phone for many cells and take the data of everybody who was in these cells and in the Berlin central city this might be tens of thousands of people tourists inhabitants um, unfortunately we cannot show you a live data set the argumentation often is um, well uh, these, this data, they are just uh, cell phone numbers, it's not that a big deal, etc. But, well, that's a problem which is solvable with the so called Bestandsdatenabfrage. <laughs> Asking phone providers for their customer data. Uh, yeah, it's, it's also called the uh, Federal Phone Book. And there are over, over a hundred authorities which are un, entitled to to do such a query which number is registered to which person and it's done that often that last year there were 12.5 million queries it's uh, one 2.5 minutes so if somebody says hey I am I have just a, a cell phone number and no person behind it, authorities can find it out. There are a lot of authorities which could do that, police, even without a judge, and they can be authorized quite, quite easily. And a police officer can do it without any further authorization. And also the providers, the operators, they need to provide an automated way of giving out this data. And there are APIs which the police can use. And so that's also why we have that a big, that a big number of queries. And that's uh, also quite a bit, uh, a bit of a back backdoor of the data retention law. Well, this is a backdoor for the data retention law. You don't need uh, a judge which needs to say yes. Which needs to decide then. It's not just concerning criminal cases, but also customs information. Loads of authorities have access to this data. And also in criminal investigations, this is not always very helpful because these data are not very reliable, because often it is the case that the data simply get outdated because SIM cards are being passed on to others. Uh, inside the same shared flat, the phone, the landline is uh, registered to one person who's long moved out. So you can't get so far with that data. Companies sometimes register hundreds of SIMs for their staff and you never know who exactly has which individual SIM card. And uh, of course, you can use that as an opportunity to protect your own data as even the Federal Office for Information Security uh, <coughs> admits because 
today in a somewhat older uh, publication, but it's still on their website. I checked. Um, why don't you use prepaid cards for anonymizations? You have no bill, you don't need a bank account. You can just pay and, and charge. And they then said, uh, swapping data uh, and uh, prepaid cards without ID checks, that's a great opportunity, a great way of uh, protecting your uh, identity effectively from mobile phone operators. This is what the state says on, on the one hand, and with the other hand, they <coughs> prohibit this. There was a law in uh, two years ago uh, that disallowed unregistered uh, prepaid cards beforehand. In theory, you would have to register, but the registration would, did not have to be checked. So you could uh, register someone called Mickey Mouse, or Andre Meister, perhaps. Hopefully, don't use, don't do that. Um, don't register them in my name. Um, but <coughs> right. But but now the uh, it was added that ID cards have to be given, or uh, if you speak with click workers, you have to register that somehow. Uh, but that is a loophole that was closed in Germany, but Germany isn't alone in the world. And in the EU, these it's not like that at all. Only the countries in red have a registration obligation. In Austria, the law is a few months old, but they uh, fell by the wayside too. They are red now, but not the UK, for example. And this is where in, in a place where EU roaming exists. So you could actually buy a SIM card in any other country and use it here. And the EU has actually noticed that uh, there is not much use in using this for terror defense. Um, in any case, if you look, if you travel internationally, it's surprising that sometimes you arrive at some airport and buy a SIM card without showing an idea at all or something. Um, disregarding the fact that that gives you much better data tariffs. So in, in the UK for 20 pounds you can buy 50 gigabytes, I noticed, without an ID card, by the way. So I paid with my credit card, but if I had paid in cash, it wouldn't have been able to track me or trace that back to me. So that's a very typical example for a so-called anti-terror law that the real terrorists are not shocked by at all. Uh, and it's one of the most easiest exercises next to uh, getting some de um, detonating chemicals to and some TNT to get a SIM card. And uh, having seen one example of mobile phone side queries uh, in the authorities' everyday life, uh, let's look at what this is based on. So the how much is it used? And the next slide will show you how often vehicles were set on fire in Berlin. That was the series of crimes that we mentioned earlier. Um, so it turns out it was a frustrated, unemployed person whose girlfriend had broken up with him. But uh, with, with connected to every single vehicle, single vehicle fire, they made these phone queries, and that's what it looks like. And that is an explanation for the number of phone side queries uh, that happened in Berlin, and that was more than a more than one every day, and that generated a lot of data sets, uh, 15 million with 11 million different um, phone, phone numbers, so far more the, probably than live in Berlin. Uh, or in the area there are about, in the agglomeration there's about four million people, one and a half mobiles per person, perhaps, and then you add people from abroad or other federal states that come to Berlin and uh, that get into the dragnet of this investigation. But then, of course, Berlin is not alone in the world. There are nice other places such as Dresden. This is a simple image for Dresden, an AFD supporter, and uh, uh, supporter for the far right alternative for Germany, and <clears throat> this is a place where the oldest cases of mobile phone cell queries were went public in 2011. They received the Big Brother Award in 2012, and uh, this was uh, a, a Nazi march uh, memor in, mem in memory of some Nazi in quote heroes, and and there were counter demonstrations and massive amounts of phone cell queries took place. And uh, 
In that event, <coughs> more than 900,000 communication center records landed at the police with a quarter of a million phone numbers. And then also they had 40,000 phone numbers that they somehow found interesting. And for those, they asked for the customer data at the operators. And that's what made mobile phone so queries very um, well known or perhaps uh, we should say ominous in the public debate. And the debate also was about the fact that uh, this uh, uh, mainly affected areas where there were demonstrations. It was just not just an intrusion into telecommunications secrecy, but also into the basic rights of freedom of assembly, because, of course, th this had a strong chilling effect if the fact that you have taken part in a demonstration will immediately land you in police computers. Of course, that's some time ago. We have current numbers from the uh, state of Saxony, where the police sometimes use these kinds of insignia, as shown in the slide, and uh, <coughs> the numbers are not always comparable. Uh, there were probably a few more phone strike queries there uh, per court case, but the numbers were high, and far more than one per day. And concerning the federal level, there are a few numbers. The Federal Criminal Police Office performed 125 phone strike queries, uh, customs uh, 96, altogether 570 or so more, than, so two per day in 2017 for Germany. We don't have overall numbers for Germany, the individual federal states. Interestingly, not all states publish these statistics or actually have these statistics, but we assume that there is at least one per federal state per day because there's no reason to assume that the other states um, will not use this. Uh, and then we have, unfortunately, we only have figures for some federal states where there was particular political pressure concerning the topic of mobile phone site queries and where this was placed on the political agenda. And the state parliaments then said, please, government, give us your numbers. But uh, there are no comparable numbers across federal states. There are not numbers from every state, and there are no numbers about across the whole federal state of uh, federal republic. And um, <coughs> there is one statistic that is not very useful because it doesn't distinguish between targeted queries and mass queries. And uh, we therefore kind of uh, try to estimate what the numbers are, and we believe that it is one query per day and federal state. And the problem with statistics <coughs> is that it's one paragraph in the criminal code uh, or the criminal pr process code, and uh, that is for all kinds of mobile phone site queries, whether it's individual or mass queries, so it's a bit hard to register this. And the complete dark zone, another complete dark zone is the area of secret services. You see the previous head of the Interior Intelligence Service, Mr. Marson here. We know that all the services do this, but we have no figures at all. We have tried for this talk to have get some international data, and uh, we use our EU networks, and unfortunately, it is the same as with all the, the federal states in Germany. Uh, there is very little. There are very little states that actually register these numbers and make them publicly accessible. That is f amazing. The police and <coughs> investigating authorities do not want <coughs> to have this topic in the public debate. In one friendly state, Denmark, we saw, we learned that there were 374 queries last year. That's Again, that's about one per year. And that <coughs> points to the impression that this is done a bit less than in Germany, but then Denmark has fewer uh, residents and uh, maybe they don't have so many vehicle arson attacks. And interestingly, a, a comparison from with uh, the US, T-Mobile, one of the large operators in the US, uh, reports for 2017 4,855 mobile phone site queries across the country and that is only one operator but not the largest and if you try to scale the numbers up you again get about one mobile phone secretary per US state and day or a bit more actually and uh, regarding the operators in Germany a phone site query is always performed with all operators uh, because you want the complete set, of course, in cases of doubts, all networks that uh, cover a certain area. I've never seen a phone site query that was just uh, put to one individual operator. But anyway, 
that's uh, so much about statistics, and we then ask ourselves if this is the scale at which it is used, the Data Protection Commissioner talks about a standard measure, then it will be interesting to know what the legal basis for this is. And there is no use, it's no use. A bit of law will have to, will be necessary. If you look at the criminal court case code, uh, and we've cut it down to the uh, in necessary sentences, which authorities are allowed to uh, conduct these queries, and it requires a suspicion that one of the particularly severe crimes has been committed. That's what the Criminal Procedure Code says. Not just severe, but particularly severe. And these particularly severe crimes have to be very severe in the, in the individual case. So if you consider the wording, there are two hurdles here, and the investigation of the fact has to be very much, dif much more difficult in other ways. And the data, which of course, as we said, could be the data of hundreds or thousands of people that are, most of all are completely innocent, so there has to be a, a proportionate amount of data, proportionate to the um, relevance of the issue in question, so it could be terrorism, uh, murder, perhaps that's what you would think. That's what the theory says. In practice, things are different. Uh, symbol image, this is Berlin police. That's, these are the guys who we got their st uh, whose statistics we got, and we checked how many terror cases there were. None. Uh, manslaughter is about 1%, and murder is about 2%. Sexual, sexual harassment, about 5 So these could be the cases where we might agree, but in the overall statistics, this is ne negligible. And the decisive crime which led to mobile phone site queries was theft. 72%, three quarters of all mobile phone site queries, various theft crimes. So you can have quite a large question mark on whether these are particularly severe crimes. And other crimes that play a prominent role here, are, for example, drugs, quite far up the list, quite high on the list, uh, in, with, with all surveillance measures that we look at, drugs are fairly about the first as soon as a new measure is introduced. Uh, we remember the Bavarian state Trojan. What was this about? Anabolica. Uh, someone from the Czech Republic uh, shipped too many pills. And another prominent thing, theft, handbag theft, for example, handbag robbed, nothing in it, then thrown away, sure. So let's have a mobile phone circuit, all of Berlin, please. And very important, credit card fraud. Again, mobile phone circuits are used whatever for. And another issue where we do agree that this is very severe crime. <laughs> Beer barrel crimes, 120 stolen. That is a severe crime. Um, a, a, a value of 33,600 euros. No, no question that it's a very severe, severe crime. The Berlin Data uh, Privacy Commissioner, uh, after we introduced this data, which is six years ago, uh, he went and asked the uh, pr prosecuting authorities for the data, when were these queries performed, and he analyzed this, and then he published a report, which can be seen on netspolitik.org, and that is quite a shocking report. Uh, it should be used only in exceptional cases, but his conclusion is that is obviously this obviously has become an everyday routine measure, and also one that is done without adherence to the criminal, the, the legal foundations, the conditions. It's not our words, the commissioner's words, a quote. And of course, he's no longer in office, but the uh, employees that were involved are still in place and they're very active ones, fortunately. And there were some structural defects that they found. Uh, proportionality is always uh, neglected, checking that, and very importantly, uh, the rights of the people concerned are ignored because they would have to be notified if in a secret investigative measure they come into that dragnet, uh, caught, are caught in that dragnet. There's a very important background in 
Because if you intrude into someone's privacy, that's always in violation of a basic rights. So according to uh, constitutional court jurisdiction, it's even worse if it's, take it, if it's done in secret. So these incisions have to be in public, and if that's not possible in a certain criminal case, then the secrecy has to be removed as soon as possible to mitigate the violation of the basic law. That's very clear. And that is implemented in the criminal procedure code. This is an extract from the law. The people concerned have to be notified. So, whom of you has been notified already? No hands up. We also don't know anybody. And what is the reason for it? The prosecutors. Yeah. prosecutors. Prosecutors. Thank you, Sabalis. So, why? What? And uh, they say that uh, there was no interest to notify somebody. We didn't know that somebody wanted to be interest uh, notified. And. Then an activist, or a friend activist, said that he would be notified. And then uh, both, that's really difficult because it's not your decision. And uh, both, if we need to, need to have a register of everybody who would want to be registered, it's very difficult. Um, alternatively, uh, why? Uh, he also tried uh, by copying his. Um, his mobile contract, so to, 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 to make sure he is authorized. There's also a passage in the law which, which uh, clears this in detail, and it's not, it's not clear for me how this passage is interpreted. Love letters only. Next answer from uh, was uh, the prosecutors. We don't have any addresses and we cannot check them because this would be a severe, a severe um, thing. And, well, they would not need any names of addresses and addresses because they have all phone numbers. They could, in theory, send SMSs or call. Seems simple, but didn't happen. But then, these guys uh, took care of the uh, of the problem that's the pirate fraction of the Abgeordneten house which the berlin parliament of the german parliament berlin yeah. and there was a hearing parliament uh, that discussed the option of uh, notifying via calls or sms and they actually managed to build up enough public pressure that the then grand coalition in berlin the social democrats and christian union uh, uh, that they actually con uh, passed uh, resolved that such a notification system should be installed and that there was of course severe resistance from the Berlin prosecuting authorities. Here's the head of that authority and he said well if we do this, that's a, such a lot of work for our prosecutors, we will not get anything else done and we still can't see any public interest in notification but uh, fortunately the Berlin parliament didn't react and they actually passed this resolution, but nothing but happened. Nothing happened. And there was the Great Coalition. Uh, Thomas Heimann was the... Yeah. He, he did. He tried to solve this programmatically. He in, in the evening at 9 p.m., um, my, phone, my phone rang. And then Thomas Hammer, sir, he, he asked uh, that he heard I could program. So the tried to torpedo it because it cost too much money. And Thomas Hammond asked, uh, thought, uh, who could who got build it? I wrote the concept, nothing happened first. Um, I don't know the backgrounds, etc. The union has just yeah, not reacted to the parliament. Then we needed a real action. 2016, there was a red, red, green coalition, and we took contact to them very fast. I got a contract to to 
uh, to such a notification system. And in 2018, this went live. So this is the mobile phone circuitry transparency system of the state of Berlin. Don't, <laughs> yeah. Don't rejoice too soon. But this is the first system across the country that we got running. This is a transparency system, the first attempt in Germany to register mobile phone circuitries or the affected people and inform them how does this work. Uh, we'll take a few, show you a few screenshots. You have to register with the system. That is the uh, rules that the uh, Berlin Parliament passed. So you enter your uh, phone number and uh, you then get uh, you receive a text message with a PIN, a confirmation code which you enter on the website, you click OK and then you receive another text message saying that you are now registered with the mobile phone security transparency system and everyone knows that then later when that uh, notification is actually triggered you receive a message like this we want to send a, a text message with a code like this and you um, get a map showing you at which point in what at what time you were caught in the net of a mobile phone sanctuary. And this is the first time that this law is actually implemented and exists, but it's also only a small first step. So we'll just play a bit of angel and devil. Why do I have to register and why am I not notified if I don't register, as the law says? Yeah, well, the formal answer would be because the parliament passed the law that passed the resolution that they but there is a, a factual answer as well and that is that you never quite know who the actual user of a mobile phone number is uh, we did say that the asking for customers data is not a very reliable way uh, at the operators they don't always know who the actual users are and with this registration that you have to repeat every three months we want to ensure that the number is actually uh, from the time of registration over the phone circuit and the notification is used by the same person. And why three months? Because my phone providers sometimes uh, will re-submit, reassign numbers after three months. So if you have this three-month interval, you can be pretty sure that a number that is actually in disuse in between is not going to be reassigned in that same period. Um, and then the registration expires and had to, would have to be repeated. So if I would forget this registration text messages, I'm out, right? Yes, yes, that is the case. But I didn't find any different, any better solution. Uh, if one of the uh, intelligent people in the room would have any better way, I'm be happy. I'll be happy to hear your advice. But it doesn't seem to be uh, possible any other way, without actually handing in any identification, uh, because that's what we don't want. We want to minimize the data. And for how long has this been live? I think mid 13th November it went live. And how many people were notified? Uh, the information notifications were only start next year. There is a two stage. Yes, it does sound absurd, but there is a reason again, um, because we can only inform about mobile phone securities that happened after registration, because otherwise we cannot make sure that it's the same person using them. We might inform people about phone securities that happened actually to previous users. That's There's no other way to do this, but that's a procedural problem, and we hope that by next summer we'll send out the first notifications. And we'll, won't that generate a database of interesting phone numbers of potential um, rebels. Yes, that is another example, uh, a disadvantage, I admit. We tried to mitigate that administratively somehow, somehow because this list, this opt-in list, could be stored with the police or the prosecuting authorities. That's what we did not do. It is held at the Justice Administrative Department of the Berlin government, so that's one step away of the actual investigating authorities and the Interior Secret Service. And it has to be said that we can never be 100% sure that these data at some point will be shared if there is a kind of uh, political will, but uh, I can say that there has been has not been such an attempt. <laughs> and, of course, the cell data has been passed on anyway. And why on this website do I have to register individually? Why aren't simply all the queries shown? That is another interesting question. The phone cell queries to publish them uh, is not actually provided for in the procedural code, and the parliament would have to resolve that this should happen as well. I, there is no legal basis, therefore, I'm interested in whether Berlin on its own can do this or whether this needs 
federal legislation, but we don't have the legal basis right now. And uh, of course, the URLs wouldn't have to be cryptic and unguessable. Yeah, that is true. That's an interesting suggestion from Andre that I took up. The ticket uh, has been added, and we'll see what we can do. Uh, as I said, this is a pilot project that Berlin, as the first federal state, has uh, set up, and uh, it was. Um, I was very, very happy to hear that other federal states were clearly interested in taking over the system and, and using it too, and so if we can build it in a way from the administrative point of view that other states could use it, uh, that could be uh, software as a service or something. How many have registered? Ah, some hands. So you all can do this in the queue. Well, we didn't actually give you the URL. That's fts.berlin.e. I hope you will not go to run a DDoS attack on it now. Okay, but then notification is only the minimal consensus of what the law says. Um, the, the, now that we have six years of a parliament res resolution, that is bad enough uh, to let people actually know how many queries take place, but that's only the basis for the population uh, actually considering whether they like this procedure and for which cases. And a while ago, I asked the police of Munich. Here is a simple image with the Munich interior minister uh, why they don't keep that data. And they said, well, we don't want to make the, every criminal aware that they should switch off their mobiles. And, well, apparently criminals never switch off their phones, right? Uh, particularly, you get the spontaneous criminals this way. If someone spontaneously draws a knife, uh, then, yes, of course, that person will not have the time to switch off their phone, but maybe they won't make a call in that time and generate a record. But the success of my phone secrets is actually very, very low. That would be, uh, uh, it's more suspicion than actually uh, identify identification and proof. There is very little actual uh, statement about successes from mobile phone secrets. You could imagine a lot in theory, but concrete evidence Statistics, this uh, conviction was only possible because of mobile phone queries I haven't heard of, and you probably didn't know that either, right? So if we all know how often such queries take place, uh, if we uh, uh, receive text messages, then of course the question is, what do you do against that? So one thing is uh, don't take your mobile phone or use a pseudonym with prepaid card, or another possibility is to become politically active. I find this uh, this is not this is uh, too much sur surveillance, which uh, should be yeah should not be that way. <laughs> and the metadata which are uh, analyzed with the cell phone query are exactly these which um, are used in data retention. Mm -hmm. That's data retention which uh, is done for everyone. It's not just for a terrorist. Everyone is being, is being under surveillance. It's thousands, ten thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of people. And also the Data, also the data, data retention law needs to go away. It, yeah. the various experiments of the German lawmakers have, uh, yeah, have uh, were not that successful. We should, we should be more pragmatic. The, Lawmaker is becoming ridiculous. So, politically, the cell, uh, phone cell query is not is not that that a big topic with a bit with a different parties. And the data protection officer, he said it's it's not. A, as a small step, I would wish to 
restore the tun, indem man sicherstellt, dass diese Maßnahme wirklich nur noch bei schwersten Straftaten So it should be ensured that this measure is always used with the most severe of crimes and that then something you could discuss politically and where should the cut off be I guess it should be about five years of expected prison sentence that's what we could call a severe crime so you could change the law saying that the judge would have to justify that in the concrete case on the basis of the current evidence a sentence of at least five years should be expected to have that in the law and and actually give a reason that would lead to mobile phone site queries for theft for example becoming illegal and would no longer occur but we it, yeah, it would, would it be really good if the existing laws would be obeyed by police. And we analyze what political parties in Germany said to the data retention and phone cell queries. We have this from CDU and CSU. These are the party manifestos for the last federal elections in 2017. They say we don't know in detail about it, but, uh, well... <laughs> We expected uh, that they are for it. Clear words from Bavaria. CSU says that we need to do more queries. And the interior secret service was to be authorized to use um, metadata. So the Social Democrats, shall I do them? We go to the Social Democrats. And... Uh, Election program, nothing. There is nothing about these topics. But <laughs> it was always the Social Democrats that brought us these laws. They were the ones responsible for these laws. So if you expect from the Social Democrats that they would go against data retention and phone sack queries, no, it won't happen. Maybe it's uh, something else with the Free Democrats. They, they would have a judgment, a judge to to to, to authorize, yeah, to authorize the queries, and they said that we don't they don't want a mass surveillance of people who did nothing, and it yeah. they did call for these measures to be reduced, um, and and some of these measures could actually be concretely be put into law. And the left party is actually the only of the large parties that clearly and unequivocally has said that they are against this. In their manifesto, they write that we want to secure the right to self-determination against data retention, against phone cell queries, video surveillance, uh, and dragnet surveillance. And the Greens... Etwa wahrscheinlich da, they, uh, well, where I am more or less, they want to strengthen proportionality and they're against data retention. It's much more effective, they write, to use proportionate measures to uh, monitor individuals who have given cause, other than uh, instead of having 80 million people monitored without the cause by data retention or phone cell queries, we are against these measures. One party is missing, the alternative for Deutschland. What do they say? Nothing, nothing in their manifesto. But, well, seriously, as if they were against surveillance and who, who <laughs> votes for Nazis because they were against phone secretaries has very different problems, actually. Has a whole lot of other problems. Yeah, right. To conclude, an outlook. This is the timeline for data retention. That's a, a, a view to history. In 2016, the current data retention law came into force, and then a few months ago, it failed at the court in Northern Westphalia, and we wait for the Constitutional Court or the European Court of Justice to officially abolish it and uh, get rid of data retention with mobile phone queries. We know of no 
concrete legal legislative measures. We showed you one particular measure, uh, how you can mitigate things with the transparency system. That is a step towards more transparency, would I like. And um, if they have to expect that their measures get known and that someone will get legal recourse, that in my view, of course, of course I'm biased. Uh, it's not in panacea, but uh, it will be necessary to reduce these measures by law, but transparency and, and monitoring from a rule of law point of view will improve things. Andre? Yes, and the next year, surely, uh, probably will be the year when the Constitutional Court in Germany will most likely rule on data retention, and in particular with the European Court of Justice judgments that we had. We assume that mass surveillance of everyone's mobile phone data will be judged to be in violation of basic rights and we're looking forward to the procedure in Karlsruhe. And that's it from us about phone cell queries, surveillance for everyone, and we're looking forward to the Q&A. Yeah, super, vielen Dank. Great, thanks. Okay, Fragen. Wir haben schon die ersten an den now, Mikrofon stehen. We have the first people queuing up for Q&A. Let's start with microphone two, please. So, the mic is open. I'm Sascha. Hi. I'm uh, of the newbies about here. I really like what you do, but how relevant is it? You, you say one one inquiry per per county per day seems pretty low to me. We have 60,000 phone cells. How relevant is it? Is it? Is, is it? Well, we didn't calculate this or estimate this. I assume that every person in Germany has uh, been caught will be caught in a phone cell query at least once a month. And if that was me, I would at least like to know this. And if I am suspected of a crime, then if I'm not suspected of a crime, then this should definitely stop. Thank you. Questions from the internet? Yes. Is there a template to get my personal data without uh, having um, a judge approve it? Because there was a GDPR query. Thank you. Um, I personally don't know any template letters. I know that Malta had to go to the courts to obtain his data from Telecom, and there was no actual judgment but a settlement. Uh, that tells me that Telecom, in the end, was willing to talk. I don't know how they would behave today if you would go to them, so I can't tell you. And I can't give you any templates. Uh, I would always uh, encourage doubt that before you go to a lawyer, you should talk to your uh, Privacy commissioners, they are often very helpful and uh, they often have good contacts in civil society. So that will be free and you could get a creative kind of help. Microphone number four. For me, the following question arises. You said that it's not pro proportionate. It, this should, but this should be, it should only be with the severe crimes. Uh, when if the, before the court, then if the defense argues that these data cannot be used, what's the situation? Well, I have to say that mostly data that's obtained illegally can be used in court in the US. Uh, these are much stricter laws. It's not what you know from the movies, but in Germany there is there is, it's almost always possible, even if an investigative measure is illegal, the data can normally be used, and I can hardly imagine how a mobile phone secretary can be 
uh, done in, at su with, with such a great violation of the law that it cannot be used. It's not, so there is no incentive to act legally, and uh, that's not the case in the U.S. Um, because investigators have to take much care not to violate the law because then the court case will blow up. But here, uh, the courts are of the strict conviction that police officers do not need to be disciplined in that way, as you can easily see. Thank you. We don't have that much time anymore. Microphone one and then mic three. Hi, thank you for the talk. What happens with the data after such a, such a query? How long are they stored somewhere at the police? That is a good question. Uh, we didn't actually talk about this much here. Uh, the police authorities do this in software. I have tried to ask them which software they use. Uh, it was something self-made. They had something called electronic file support system. They actually put this into Excel sheets at some point, but this blew up on them because the data became too large. And then there is a, a software called Rola RS case, and IBM has a software, and they try to uh, find cross uh, hits, for example, with those vehicle arson attacks, which phones are present in several in several locations. And that's that leads me to the point. They try to find these data through different instances. If they do not use that data any longer, they have to delete it. But the uh, State Privacy Commissioner of Berlin uh, actually verified how, checked how, how this is done, and he noticed that after many years, these data still existed in, in the file. And also it's said that these data should only be used as a last resort. And it turned out that they uh, make run the query, put it on a CD, and don't even look at the data. So that's... Um, you can assume that they are deleted soon, but, but no, that's not happening. Um, the law says that data should be deleted as soon as the court case is legally over uh, or once the legal term has expired, and uh, that would be quite a long time. Expiry deadlines are 10 or 20 years. Uh, but I at least can say about Berlin that the police are trying hard to be legal, to act legally and restrict the access to these data. Uh, Andre already mentioned uh, that things are put on a CD, so they're out of the regular system. You put the CD into the file and therefore you can't easily access it only if you actually look into the file. So generally, police were extremely cooperative uh, also when we evaluated the system. Uh, I wasn't that sure, but my experience was very good. They do seem to want their system in Berlin. That's my impression. The uh, civil servants I was dealing with, uh, for some reason, whether that's a PR measure, whether they are afraid that they would have to manually process these queries, I don't know. But they were very cooperative. And uh, thank you. The last question. So, your question, please. Hi. Hello. Nice talk. Um, each car has a telemetry box. They have SIM cards. And will, the, will each car be tracked in the future? Well, it will be registered in this measure, that is for sure. Uh, phone stack queries will capture this, data retention will capture this, and then there is this e, -car, e call. Yes. Uh, with the mobile phone secretary, we have just one mosaic piece, one puzzle piece of the whole set of state surveillance measures. Uh, car surveillance, there is a lot. Uh, we are in the year five or six after Snowden, so there's all kinds of surveillance technologies out there. Car surveillance using the mobile ZIMs that are in there, that's a wide area, of course, but these data will be registered in phone circuitries. Thank you. Thank you very much. A great applause for our speakers, Andre and Ulf.